For the longest time, I was wondering why a game that seemed to sell itself as a bartending simulator had so much fanfare behind it. From what little I had seen, and considering the game's tagline was Cyberpunk Bartender Action, I assumed this game would lean in heavily into its bartending concept. Thanks to the game's high reviews and the unique premise, I was keen on trying out Valhalla to see just what it was about. After putting it off for several years, I finally gave it a shot when it was ported over to the Switch. Not too long into my initial playthrough, I realized Valhalla was not quite what I was expecting it to be. Upon starting the game, you're presented with an optional tutorial which dispels any notion that this was made out to be any kind of intricate bartending simulation. Instead, Valhalla is a visual novel where more importance is placed on who you serve than what you serve. You chat with customers and read what interesting things they have to say either about themselves or the cyberpunk future this world takes place in. As the only real location you spend time in in this game is the bar, the people coming in give a small glimpse into how life outside is. Valhalla likes to tease bigger issues going on outside, but it's ultimately the people you meet that end up taking the spotlight and receive any kind of development. It might sound annoying that Valhalla teases these interesting things going on, but since the character writing was so enjoyable to read through, I never found this as a nuisance as the character interactions and conversations were interesting enough to carry the game and keep me invested. Alongside the characters, something I grew to like early on was this game's presentation. Albeit simple, it does enough to create the atmosphere of a soothing bar setting. The use of neon colors does enough to highlight this as a cyberpunk game, and so does the matching music. I like how there's a jukebox option to where you can choose what songs play in the background, but not having a shuffle option here was missed on my subsequent playthroughs. I also went out of my way to play this game at night, during my first run, which only added that much more to the experience since the story takes place in the evenings of the in-game month. Another thing I enjoyed seeing as I went through the game were all the weird anime and internet culture references to be found. As someone who's very much in tune with that kind of stuff, I enjoyed recognizing certain things the game was alluding to, but I do wonder how people less familiar perceived those moments or easter eggs in the game. As I'm about to get to, Valhalla still manages to have a quality story, so the creators injecting their interests here from time to time in the form of quirky references never felt too intrusive, as the game's main focus was handled well. Besides the customers you serve, you will also follow your player character Jill Stingray. I am by no means an expert on visual novels, so maybe what I'm about to say is wrong, but my assumption is that usually player characters in them aren't really fleshed out or don't go beyond being self-inserts. Whatever the case may be, Valhalla spends a lot of time characterizing Jill, and by the end of the game, she stands out as the best part of Valhalla. As you're constantly engaging with customers of all walks of life, you get to see how Jill chooses to interact with these different types of people, whether it be not tolerating their bothers and behavior, or being more sympathetic towards those who are down on their luck. While Jill likes to present herself as this serious person, not one to really play along, there's plenty of moments that show she's not quite like the persona she puts on. As you progress, you find out more weird quirks about her, further fleshing her out, to where I imagine there is at least one thing everyone can relate to about Jill's character. One moment I quite like in this game is the night her boss Donna comes over and the two just talk casually like friends would while drinking. Nothing of story relevance is really said during this conversation, but it does give more insight into both characters. Donna herself is a bit of an enigma and is one of the few times you have a long conversation with her. As for Jill, this is where you learn more about several of those traits which add up to who she is. When it comes to the game's main conflict, this is all irrelevant, but it all accumulates to making Jill that much deeper of a character. That way, when the main conflict of the game is revealed, we can much easier attach ourselves to her as just more than an entity serving drinks. Before I begin to discuss spoilers, I want to make mention of how Valhalla progresses. Since the main conflict of the game 
doesn't present itself until halfway into it. Leading up to the game's major reveal, Valhalla feels very slice of life, as all you're doing up to that point is conversing with customers and living day to day working at the bar and resting at your apartment. There are some teases of potential plot lines, but these mostly serve as background dressing. Although if you're keen, you may spot what Valhalla winds up focusing on with the couple hints it drops. Here's my spoiler section, but honestly, I think the game is written well enough to where the reveal is effective and has impact even when you know what it is. You come to find out that the reason Jill is working at Valhalla in the first place is due to her leaving a previous relationship where she felt trapped into a career choice supported by her girlfriend, but she herself felt uneasy about. As she had spent the entirety of her college years working towards this career, in parallel with her girlfriend Lenore who studied in the same field, she felt she may have wasted her time to where it will lead to a midlife crisis later in life. Wanting to break free and experience freedom, Jill storms off to find a new walk of life. Although Jill now lives month by month with her current job, she feels she's in a better place than had she stuck with what she studied for. For a cyberpunk game, this setup to Jill feels quite contemporary and won't be the only thing in this game that feels that way. As I further discuss Valhalla, a thing to keep in mind is that while it certainly embraces its setting, a lot of the talking points the characters go through feel quite contemporary and don't necessarily rely on existing in this futuristic setting. Speaking of relatable, this conflict Joe goes through before the beginning of the game is something I myself can relate to heavily, namely in choosing to exit out of a potential STEM career in favor of something else. That anxiety Joe expresses with how her life was going is something I and myself have experienced and it's one of those many things in this game I feel a lot of other people can connect to. In reading about the development of Valhalla, the writer mentions how certain things from his own life influenced aspects of the game, and it very much shows with how certain characters are depicted, including Jill. Sometime before the game's climax, it's revealed that despite leaving Lenore behind, she still harbors feelings for her, but is too scared to make up in fear of what she might say. While this has been a bit of a background issue gnawing at Jill's mind, it's once again brought at the forefront of her life when her ex's younger sister, Gabby, shows up at the bar unexpectedly one day. Gabby comes to deliver the news that her sister had passed away recently from a disease called nanomachine rejection. As Gabby is still relatively young and of course caught up in her emotions, she ends up lashing out at Jill pinning her death as a result of her and Lenore's argument that led to the two going their separate ways, as it wasn't until they broke up that Lenore started showing symptoms. Jill herself lashes out as well, with this whole encounter throwing her into a downward spiral of regret and self-pity, as she constantly asks herself why she never mustered the strength to talk to Lenore one more time. Gabby later ends up reaching out to her again in hopes of talking it out more formally, but even so, Jill is once again hesitant to talk in fear of what might happen. It's then up to Jill's friends to emotionally support and guide her into finally closing this chapter of her life. I quite like the story Valhalla presents, and even though I was enjoying myself for the first half, where there wasn't much of a through line to the game, Valhalla wouldn't have left as strong of an impression on me without this focus on the main character. I like how it holds out on presenting this conflict as it gives time for us to get to know Jill and care about her. One of my least favorite things in media is seeing something tragic happen to a character we barely know or care about, but the story expects us to care anyway. At least for myself, Jill was a likable character and by the halfway point, you know well enough about her to grow attached. By then, you're also well acquainted with her various relationships, and it feels that much more natural how her friends react to try and help. Related to this, a personal highlight of the game is this one moment when the then goofball character Virgilio sort of breaks character to deliver sound advice to Jill, who up to this point just barely tolerated his odd behavior at the bar. I like how this one character who probably was aware of how he was being seen, 
still went out of his way to try and console Jill in whatever way he could. Other more prominent characters such as Donna, Dorothy, and Alma also go out of their way to support Jill to where it really shows, at least in the case of the latter two, that Jill goes beyond just being their local bartender and is instead a dear friend of theirs. For a game I thought would just be about serving drinks, this is a bit of a heavy plot. While the game can get quite serious, Valhalla also never forgets to add levity, and the game, even with its heavy story moments, is still an overall easygoing and heartwarming experience. That isn't to take away from those heavier scenes though, as on repeat playthroughs, I still found myself emotionally moved, especially with the game's ending. I think Valhalla does a good job separating its serious moments, and when it likes to have fun, to bring back my comments on the creators being goofy with their game sometimes. Valhalla, despite it being a visual novel, doesn't have anything like multiple endings. There are a couple of after credit scenes you can unlock based on how well of a bartender you are to key characters, and there is a quote unquote bad ending, which is a different after credit scene which also happens to lock you out of seeing the other scenes you may have unlocked. But otherwise, Valhalla's story is always the same. If you manage to save your money and pay your rent, you're good to go. What Valhalla does have is a prologue and epilogue you can access from the main menu, as both were patched into the game after its initial release, and thus not directly integrated into the main plot. The prologue gives further context to the first day, some later dialogue brought up by Jill, and introduces the pair of Betty and Deal. If you don't mind skipping the tutorial, you can jump straight into it. After the prologue, there is a separate day taking place in between both it and the first day of the main story, with this in-between day focusing on the character of Anna. Anna is also focused on in the game's epilogue, which is only unlocked upon completion of a new game plus playthrough. I did just mention there are no multiple endings, so perhaps seeing this epilogue may not be as big of an incentive to replay the game, but I'll later explain why there's more to see here than one may think. But back to Anna. She's someone which for the longest time, I questioned her existence slash inclusion in the game. Anna is a mysterious reoccurring character who's basically a ghost there to mostly pester Jill and break the fourth wall. And while her conversation with Jill in the game's epilogue is one of the finer moments Valhalla has to offer, I felt that she could have been removed from the game without really affecting much of it. I liked her, don't get me wrong, I never hated her character, but I felt she was an unnecessary inclusion. Valhalla is mostly grounded in reality, even with its futuristic setting, so having what might as well be a ghost felt very strange. It was only until further thinking, I realized she may have been written to be a foil to Jill. Anna is constantly playful and likes to tease Jill, who's a far more serious person most of the time. Anna suffered from nano machine rejection and even while at the hospital, succeeded in her studies, whereas Jill started struggling with school and college, needing Lenora's support to make it through. While at the hospital, Anna had a romantic relationship with another girl by the name of Lynette, who also suffered from nanomachine rejection. She died from it, but Anna was able to survive and despite losing a loved one, had her whole life ahead of her, only for her to be run over shortly after exiting the hospital in almost comical timing. We could assume Anna had some proper goodbye with Lynette, which contrasts Jill and Lenore where they never had a final farewell. Where both Anna and Lynette passed away, Jill has the rest of her life to live out, not just for her sake, but also to amend her past relationship in the form of looking over Gabby. I'm not sure how much merit this headcanon of mine has, but it's how I will choose to accept Anna's character, besides her being just some not so spooky ghost haunting Jill. While I'm still somewhat on the topic of Valhalla's story, and I want to cover as many bases with this game as possible, I really want to mention the spin-off title Valhalla has, since upon completing it, I decided to see what else the fine people at Tsukuban Games had to offer relating to this game. It's not canonical as it contradicts information given in main game, but if you like Valhalla enough and want to see more of these characters interact, 
I suggest checking out Valhalla Kids as well. It's a visual novel available only on PC, with this time focusing on Donna and having all the characters as younger versions of themselves. You can think of this game as a bit of an OVA, as ultimately it's just fan service for those seeking it out, and it's also quite short with my playthrough just around half an hour, completing the story and looking for any optional content within it. As of the release of this video, a sequel was announced a few months back, and was supposed to have been released already, but was pushed back and it remains to be seen when it will come out. Just wanted to bring this up as no other Ball Hall review has mentioned it, though that's probably because most reviews for this game on YouTube were likely made before Kids came out. Oh well. As mentioned before, you spend most of the game reading what your customers have to say. While Jill is still the focus of the game and receives the most development, that doesn't mean the customers at the bar are any less important to what Valhalla is about. Instead of tackling the major issues at large in the society, Valhalla would rather showcase the more personal stories people have to tell of what it's like to live in such a place. The bar gets all kinds of patrons, some more likable or memorable than others, but they all serve a purpose. Mario shows how courier jobs haven't been taken over completely by robots, while Kira Mickey shows that AI is far enough to where they can be successful idols. These two characters specifically also do have a bit more going on to them beyond these quick descriptions. Mario is insecure about his masculinity, meanwhile Kira Mickey, if you manage to unlock her special dialogue, presents the dilemma of at what point does your stage persona completely take over who you are. At the very least, characters exist to show a facet of the cyberpunk future, showing how far things have come or how even this far beyond, people still deal with the same types of issues we do today. There's a cyber enhanced bounty hunter talking about the bounty hunting business in Glitch City, a normal girl who hates her job and wants to blow off some steam, and everything in between. When it comes to the characters in the game, there is one encounter which feels slightly out of place which would be a duo of cosplayers near the end of the game. They say there are cosplaying characters from a popular game known as Yik. You may think this is just some in-universe thing, as this same game is referenced two other times within Valhalla, but it is in fact a very real game you can go out and play, published by the same company who published Valhalla. If there is anything to nitpick Valhalla for, it's the fact that it includes these random moments of praise to a game that will be universally panned. I wonder if this cross promotion was due to the publisher or the people at Tsukuban Games being nice shouting out their fellow indie devs. Outside this odd moment in the game, Valhalla's cast is overall quite likable which adds to that comforting atmosphere the game has where you look forward to seeing what your friends in game have to say the next time they come in. It reminded me of Persona, where you don't want the game to end, so you could keep seeing these characters interact with one another. What I want to focus on in the following section are two other prominent characters who particularly stood out to me. Since I'd rather not waste time covering every major character, I think me talking about these two will show just why Valhalla left such an impression on me. I want to start with Dorothy, as she's the more interesting of the two, at least for myself. Dorothy is a Lilum, which is this game's term for advanced AI basically. While mentally she's a 24 year old, she has kept the appearance of a 13 year old. Her occupation is that of a sex worker, or you want to be more specific, a prostitute. While Dorothy herself is never explicitly sexualized within the game due to having this occupation, this decision to have such a young looking character doing this could be considered taboo and may raise some eyebrows. However, in all the time I've known about this game, I have never seen anyone call out Valhalla for doing this, and that's for good reason. The game treats this character with respect and handles the topic well. When checking out the developer's blog and reading the various posts detailing the creation process behind certain characters, within Dorothy's entry, it said how she was purposely made like this to push the envelope a bit. It could be seen as controversial having such a young looking character working as a prostitute, but by going through with this, such a decision can raise some discussion of just what kind of world Valhalla takes place in and how that could possibly relate to our own. 
discussions such as having a society that can accept advanced AI as sexual partners, especially ones that border on these gray areas. There's an interesting conversation which can be had about this topic, but that's beyond my scope or this videos, so I'll leave it at that. A similar discussion can be had about having a society that can destigmatize sex work. The other interesting facet of Dorothy is how much of a positive person she is, this positivity extending to her line of work. Prostitutes in media are commonly depicted in a negative light, something that could have been further amplified when we consider Valhalla's grimy cyberpunk setting. But here, Dorothy loves what she does, having full agency of her situation. By having such a positive depiction of this character archetype, I can see how this could break people's perception of what sex work is. She's a provocative character by design, but it never feels offensive or edgy for the sake of being edgy. The game treats her with respect, and never does it feel like this was done just because they could. Clearly thought went into designing this character and how she was depicted. While Jill remains the most fleshed out character, as she is the leading lady here, I find Dorothy just as fascinating as a character. I also have yet to mention the existential episode she has, which temporarily breaks her usual behavior of being cheerful. This is another highlight moment for me, not just because of what Jill has to say to her, but because this decision to have her break character a bit makes her feel more human, ironically enough. Not every character gets this type of attention, but when those moments do happen, they went a long way for me to further care about those on screen. Within those blog posts, the idea of breaking the mode of commonly seen character archetypes is mentioned as one of the goals Valhalla was striving for. This can be seen with Dorothy as I've gone over, the duo of Stella and Say, and in Alma who's the other character I want to go over. Of course, Valhalla isn't special for not following character stereotypes, and it's obviously not the only piece of media out there being a mold breaker in this regard. I praise Valhalla for what it's able to say with its characters, and from how often they felt relatable, and ultimately how likable they were. For a game whose alternate name is Waifu Bartending, I like that the characters here aren't just pretty faces, and have actual depth to them. Alma breaks the mold of the standard hacker archetype by being quite attractive instead of some geek you might come to expect with this type of character. With this being a cyberpunk game after all, it makes sense to have this type of character present, but instead of choosing to focus on her career in cybersecurity, she mostly talks about her ongoing issues with her love life and her family. It's in her family problems where the game strikes eerily close to home as Alma often expresses her disapproval of her older sibling's behavior. Even if the situation isn't quite the same, I could still heavily relate to her as she vented about her sibling's questionable decisions. The other reason why I wanted to bring up Alma is because she's part of arguably the best scene in the game. Earlier when I mentioned Valhalla having heartwarming moments, if you play the game, the scene where Alma and Jill swap places likely sprung into your head. Here, Alma is once again venting about her sister, where it then leads to Alma lending an ear to Jill, who's very much visibly distressed. As Alma puts it, Jill helped by lending an ear, and now she wants to return the favor. Loosely tied to this, the quote-unquote bad ending of the game has Jill living at Alma's after she was evicted from her apartment. So clearly these two are very close friends, though sadly not as close as Jill may want. As I said, I won't be going over every character, but if you want to learn more about what went into creating the cast, I recommend reading through the developer's blog, which proved to be quite useful in making this video. Moving on, before I get to the final major part of this review, I want to at least make mention of some of the commentary Valhalla does. Much like with visual novels as a medium, I am not all too familiar with cyberpunk as a genre outside the obvious things most people associate with cyberpunk stories. Even with my incredibly basic understanding of the genre, I still appreciated some of the things Valhalla said considering its setting. There is this one conversation which still sticks out to me, where the detective Art Von Delay, who's known for buying cheap drinks, is arguing with the incredibly wealthy Stella 
about the pros and cons of having excessive corporate control over the city. Stella argues this brings in more jobs. Glitch City becomes the forefront of new technology and AI advancements. While the detective says that many of these new advancements made will only benefit the wealthy anyway, and that the people of Glitch City don't need any more corporations flexing control over them. This is honestly quite close to current day issues, where the wealth gap continues to grow and cities bend over backwards to allow companies to plant themselves and make business. Out of all the commentary Valhalla has, the one to truly stick out is the hyperinflation in Glitch City. I don't remember if this is specifically mentioned, but there are enough clues here to give away that prices in Valhalla aren't quite normal. It's unknown where exactly the game takes place, but considering the mention of two US locations in the game, let's assume this game takes place in the United States. A specific year also isn't given as only 27x is shown, so let's go with 2070 for my example. The cheapest drink at Bella What the Bar goes for $80. Plugging this into the calculator, that equals to $24 in current day money. While I can't say I know much about the prices of fancy drinks at bars, Considering this is the cheapest drink at a bar that isn't even a good part of town, clearly something is off because I don't think any crappy bar would charge that much for a drink. It just so happens to be that the two creative leads of the game are from Venezuela, a country ravaged by hyperinflation among a myriad of political problems. It would not at all surprise me if the living conditions surrounding the bar had some inspiration from them living in Venezuela. We now have reached the reason why I was initially interested in this game, which at this point you've seen enough footage to realize there isn't a whole lot to mixing drinks. Customers will tell you what they want, you look it up in the menu, you click on the ingredients how many times it's required to do so, and that's all there is to it. The tutorial at the beginning will teach you everything you need to know, and it's not like new mechanics or anything like that are slowly introduced as you progress deeper into the game. As for deviating away from the drink recipes, you can choose to make certain drinks larger by doubling ingredients, thus increasing the amount of money you make, or you can put however much alcohol you want in a drink when it has the optional karma treat tag. There is some challenge at times when customers give a vague description for the drink they want or when they expect you to serve them the usual, but if you're paying any amount of attention, you should be able to remember what drinks they are referring to. There is a focus mechanic in the game where Jill at the start of certain days before heading to work will want something from the store and if you don't buy it, she will be distracted at work for the day. When you load into the drink menu, instead of repeating the customer's order or suggesting an alternative, Jill will make some comment on how she should have been paying more attention. The only time this will really come back to fight you is if say you get off for a small break and when you come back, you forget the customer's order as well which yes, this did happen to me. If you're good with your orders and never spend your money on optional items, you should have no issue being able to afford the knickknacks of the store whenever Jill is craving one. These items, by the way, are to decorate your room with a few serving alternate uses or acting as Easter eggs, such as the two items, which when bought together, will unlock a Toho-esque minigame, which took me far too long to beat. I've never played bullet hell games outside those stages in Cuphead, so this was pretty challenging for myself, but I hear this is quite easy in comparison to what's out there, so take that as you will. But remember that Valhalla, apart from this small distraction, is a visual novel, and something I associate visual novels with are dialogue options. Something absent from Valhalla, except for the epilogue, that is, if you look at them from the traditional manner. Normally, a few dialogue choices would pop up on the screen for you to then pick one to influence the conversation and possibly how the game progresses slash ends. Valhalla instead integrates this feature with the drinks you serve, and depending on what you give your customer, the conversation may either have different lines or go an entirely different direction altogether. This is where the bartending part of the game stands out, not in the gameplay, but in how you can influence your customer's behavior with your drinks. Most of the time, you'll be reading the default dialogue as you serve the drinks the game will usually expect you to serve. 
If a customer asks for a certain drink, you'll serve it without giving it a second thought about what might happen if you choose to serve something else. If you happen to serve an incorrect drink, the game will also acknowledge this with some minor dialogue changes, but nothing too major. Just note that serving any order wrong will block you out of your daily cash bonus, so maybe don't get crazy experimental on an initial playthrough where you preferably want the extra cash on hand to ensure the good ending. Then there are scenarios where you can get creative with what you choose to serve your customer based upon what they say or order. There are more obvious examples, such as with Mario when he's conflicted with ordering either girly or manly drinks, depending on what you choose to serve him the way his conversation goes that day will change. Most of the time, the game will hint towards alternate choices, if there are any, through Jill's thoughts in the drink menu, or you may realize what other drinks may provoke a reaction, like when a customer orders a pile driver versus a suplex, or any of the three blast drinks. Oddly enough, one of the most obscure branching conversations in the game is on the first day. Without giving too much information away, on day one of the game, the customer and Graham will be asking for bitter drinks. However, if you start serving him sweet drinks, not only does the game not count this as an error, but he will talk more as to why he's so bitter that day. Depending on how many sweet drinks you serve him, up to three, you will get a varying amount of change to the conversation with them. As far as extremely obscure conversations which you can unlock go, there aren't many such as these with the most secret conversations being cameo characters which only appear when you serve the game's secret drink, which I'll provide a hint on screen if you don't want to look it up. Before I get to the most prominent way you can influence your customer's behavior, it's about time I bring up my one major complaint with the game, and that is continuity. There are a handful of times where the game doesn't acknowledge a previous conversation which has taken place. To bring up the Ingram example again, he reveals his relationship with another character who later appears. The next day, when said character comes to the bar, Jill won't acknowledge when this person brings up that same scenario from their perspective. What makes this even weirder for this example? Jill does acknowledge her conversation with Ingram, but with another character on that second day. There are some other continuity errors which I found in my three playthroughs of the game, so if you play the game enough, you're bound to have another situation where Jill or some other character doesn't acknowledge a scenario which has happened before. For a game that I think does a pretty good job at immersing you, having these immersion breaking errors does take you out of it for a bit. While not the biggest issue at the end of the day, and I can't expect the developers to cover for every interaction in the game, especially considering this was their first game, it was notable enough to bother me a bit when I found these inconsistencies. Finally, this brings me to what some of you might have thought by now. If you're working as a bartender, and if you can influence how much alcohol you serve your patrons as I mentioned earlier, does that mean you can get characters drunk? Well, the answer isn't so simple as maxing out alcohol as soon as possible to see how your customers react under the influence. For some characters, they can't even get drunk no matter how much alcohol you serve them. At least in all my playthroughs, I think all the male characters didn't have a special sprite nor dialogue tied to them reaching a drunken state at the bar. Which leaves us with the female cast members who can get drunk but only on certain days. I tested this with Alma, where I gave her the maximum of alcohol possible and she stayed sober throughout the conversation when otherwise she would have gotten drunk on another day. In testing with the alcohol mechanics, I also think each character has a varying alcohol tolerance level. Betty, who's presented as a bit of a heavier drinker than other characters, seems to have a higher tolerance, so much so in fact, that on one of the days she has special dialogue from being tipsy, I had to serve her a drink she didn't ask for just to get her drunk as her regular orders didn't quite cut it. This counted as an error, but I was at least able to access the fun dialogue there. To bring up continuity again, there are times when a character getting drunk is acknowledged the next time they visit, but this doesn't happen all the time if I remember correctly. For a game that seems linear, it offers a surprising amount of varying changes to the conversations presented. Even on my third playthrough, 
I was still discovering alternate dialogue thanks to me experimenting with what I was serving, though this is because I hold back a bit because a part of me feels bad for purposely serving these characters the wrong drinks. Regardless, for a visual novel that only has one ending, there's enough content here to where a second playthrough can be a very different experience. I love how Valhalla was able to creatively utilize its concept considering its limitations. For a first game, especially one presented as a visual novel, I love how instead of trying to think of all these ways to make the bartending part of the game interactive in ways you can mix drinks, they use their bartending concept as a way to creatively present a visual novel staple. From what I've seen of Valhalla's sequel in Nirvana, it looks like they are revamping and adding a lot more to the gameplay, but at least for now in Valhalla's case, this limited gameplay worked just fine and I wouldn't call it a negative to the game. When I first finished Valhalla, I was mostly impacted by the characters and story here, but now having played the game multiple times, I have a further appreciation of how the bartending aspect of the game was utilized, as I was initially unimpressed once I saw how simple it seemed. This now brings me to the end of my review on Valhalla. This is a game I love very, very much, and in making this review, I wanted to cover as much as possible about it, especially since I was unimpressed by the other reviews of this game online. I never expected to become so enthralled with this weird bartending game, but once I did, I could not stop further looking into it and what all led to its creation. It stands as one of my favorite games of all time, which at any given opportunity I recommend, and I hope my extensive video on it has convinced you to try it out yourself. And if you have played it already, perhaps you shared my sentiments with the game, have learned a bit about it, or simply gained the urge to replay it again. As said, I will be linking the developer's blog in the description, which not only proved to be a massive asset in creating this video, but on its own was an interesting read to get into the minds of first-time game developers. For my final words, within the span of me working on this project, Valhalla's own sequel in Nirvana went from a 2020 release date to a now currently to be determined date. As with any game, I wish the developers the best of luck in creating the best possible product, and I will patiently wait to return to the world of cyberpunk, bartending, and waifus which the fine people at Sukaban Games have created.